guys, and welcome to the Moms and Mysteries podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I am doing well. Surviving the month of April, which I think I may have mentioned before, is the busiest month yes. of the year for me. I have like everybody I know and care about is got a birthday in April. So it's just a this very busy, busy month. The second year in a row you've said it that exact way, knowing yeah. good and well my birthday is not in April. <laughs> oh, oh two gosh. years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, everyone it's like one of those that I know and care like, about except Melissa. <laughs> oh, thank you. And thank my you. children. I mean, gosh, I guess they're chopped liver too. You can get in the bin with them. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> it's me and them against the world, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, so we just celebrated my husband's birthday this week, and we've got all fun birthday activities planned for the weekend. So yeah, I'm just exhausted, to tell you the truth, but we're making it. Nice. My husband's birthday's <laughs> in a couple of weeks, and I've commissioned like, an, not commissioned, but like we have a family member that's an artist, and I'll have to send you, once it's done, I'll post it, because he doesn't know this yet. I'll post it, but it's the most ridiculous, amazing thing, and I'm so excited about it. Is this it. what I was seeing on the Instagram messages going back yes, and forth? I yes. haven't looked at them, but I did see that you were, I could tell that's what you were talking about. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's going to be great. So I'm not tired because I'm literally contributing nothing for that. <laughs> there you go. So that's yeah, the way to so, do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. So we'll get into the story for this week. As we all know, the world that we live in isn't always necessarily a safe place. If you listen to a lot of true crime, then you know that danger can be lurking in the most unsuspecting places, and that even those closest to us can betray us in the most ultimate ways. We all do our best to avoid dangerous situations, and we have a reasonable expectation of safety in these average everyday lives that we have. So it makes it that much more shocking when a murder happens at a place and time that nobody would expect or when it happens to a person that nobody would expect. On the morning of April 18th, 2016, clients of Missy Beavers arrived at the Creekside Church of Christ in Midlothian, Texas for a 5 a.m. Camp Gladiator fitness class. It was a rainy morning, so instead of working out outside in the parking lot like they usually did, Missy decided to move the class inside the church building. She got there at 4.16 a.m. and parked her truck under an awning at the south entrance of the church so that she could unload her fitness equipment and carry it all inside. At 5 a.m., two of the campers, which is just what they call the people who attend Camp Gladiator classes, uh, they went inside the church and made their way to the southwest corner of the building where the class was to be held. When they got there, they found their fitness instructor, 45-year-old Missy Beavers, lying unresponsive in a pool of blood with broken glass scattered all over the floor. Several tools, including a large hammer that came from inside the church, were also found near her body. The campers who found Missy called 911 and then called Missy's husband, Brandon, to let him know that there was an emergency. Missy was a wife and mother of three girls who found a passion for fitness in her 40s and transformed herself into the most physically fit she'd ever been. And that's when she decided to take the next step and help others achieve the same results. Becoming a Clamp Gladiator fitness instructor was the perfect choice for Missy, who had this background in teaching, but had been a stay-at-home mom since the birth of her first daughter. Missy had a clear devotion to her mission of helping others in her Facebook bio as well. It said, quote, having an impact on others and helping others reach their fitness and health goals is my passion. She often posted about her upcoming Camp Gladiator classes and encouraged people to attend. She truly wanted to inspire her campers to be mentally, emotionally, and spiritually fit. Missy was a Texas native who grew up in Jacksboro with her two brothers. From an early age, Missy had a way of making friends with ease, and she would welcome anyone as long as they were willing to have fun. It was said that Missy never met a stranger, and she really treated everyone like they were family. She was willing to give whatever she had to others. Missy went on to attend several colleges before settling at Carleton State University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in 1995. Missy actually worked in retail for several years before she met her husband, Brandon Beavers, who she married in June of 1998. After getting married, Missy had a renewed focus on life, and she decided to go back to school to become a special education teacher. Missy taught in a classroom for several years, but when she and Brandon found out that they were expecting their first child— Missy's priorities shifted, and the couple decided that they would have Missy stay at home to raise their daughter. Missy always said that going back to work as a teacher wasn't out of the question, but motherhood was her first priority at the time. 
In March of 2003, Missy and Brandon welcomed another little girl, and Missy's love for being a mom grew even bigger. Missy really just loved having her family with Brandon, and she enjoyed taking care of her family and taking care of their home. And in 2007, a third little girl was welcomed into the Beavers' home. Missy really saw to every need of her family. She was an extremely supportive mom and wife, and she encouraged both her husband and her daughters to really live out their dreams. Missy had a strong faith, and she believed that anything was possible if you believed in yourself and you had God's help. Missy was known for being a huge motivator in the lives of those who were lucky enough to know her. She lived her whole life with a passion for her family, her friends, love, and laughter. The day before Missy was found dead, Brandon had actually flown off to Biloxi, Mississippi for a fishing trip that he'd been planning for over a year. Missy stayed home with the three girls, and Brandon arrived in Mississippi at 7.30 on April 17th. At 7.55 that evening, Missy posted on Facebook about her Monday morning Camp Gladiator class at Creekside Church, and she posted that the class started at 5 a.m., and she said, if it's raining, we're still training. No excuses. You are gladiators. At 9.15 p.m., Brandon posted a photo from outside the Half Shell Oyster House in Biloxi, Mississippi, and captioned it with, first stop after a five-hour plane trip. A few minutes later, at 9.23, Missy posted on Facebook again, saying that she was going to bed because she had to be up at 3.30 in the morning. Missy and Brandon talked on the phone to each other before Missy went to bed, and that was the last time Brandon would ever talk to his wife. Surveillance footage showed that Missy arrived at the church at 4.16 a.m. on April the 18th. It had just stopped raining, so Missy planned to have the class inside that day. She pulled up under an awning and got out to unload her truck. Just 45 minutes later, when it was 5 a.m. and the class attendees had made their way inside, they found Missy lying lifeless in a pool of blood. After they called 911, one of the campers called Brandon, but we're not exactly sure what was said in that conversation. After finding out that there was some kind of an accident or emergency, Brandon called his mom, Marsha, and told her that Missy was in a car accident. So again, we're not really sure if he just misunderstood what was going on right. or kind of where it was just something in the confusion. So Brandon then rented a car and began making the drive home from Mississippi back to Texas. Meanwhile, his mom then called her daughter, who's Brandon's sister, Christy, and told her that Missy was in a car accident, and she asked Christy to go over to the Beaver's house to be with the kids, who were still asleep. Christy and Marsha both headed over to Brandon and Missy's house and met each other there. While they were on the way, an officer called Christy and told her that Missy had unfortunately passed away. Officers later told the family that she had been assaulted and had died inside the church. Man. When first responders arrived at 5.10 that morning, they cleared the building and made their way to the hallway where Missy was lying down, critically injured. The medics got to work trying to save Missy's life. Other first responders looked around the building and they noticed a lot of broken glass scattered throughout the church, as well as this evidence of forced entry, leading them to believe that this was a possible burglary. They found double-busted doors on the northeast corner of the church, but it didn't look like anyone had actually gone through them. They were just broken. There was also a metal door with a busted window on the north side, and it did appear that the attacker entered through this door, possibly by reaching inside the broken window and using the doorknob. Missy's gray Ford F-150 was found still parked under the awning outside. The passenger door was open, and the lid of the truck bed was open as well. The keys to the truck were found sitting on the tailgate. Missy's personal belongings, including her phone, her wallet, handbag, iPad, and her gun, were all found inside of her truck, untouched. Despite the efforts to revive and stabilize Missy, first responders were unable to resuscitate her, and she was pronounced dead at the scene. Authorities then had to contact Brandon and tell him the news, and Missy's body was transported to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. It wasn't long after Missy was found dead that detectives arrived at the scene to start their investigation. This was the first murder the town of Midlothian had seen in seven years. One of the first things they did was check for surveillance footage from the church. Unfortunately, there was no surveillance outside the church due to a pre-existing malfunction that they had with this equipment that the church had already been aware of, meaning 
it's not like a suspect came in, turned those cameras off or anything like that. The ones that were outside were not working at the time, but the cameras inside the church were still working. So investigators were able to review that footage. The tape showed that the suspect was first seen on camera at the church at 3.50 a.m., but at that time, the person was already inside the church. They had broken in and entered from somewhere off camera. Also, there was no alarm system in place at the church, so this initial break-in went undetected. The person that was seen in these tapes had on a police SWAT-style outfit with tactical gear and a heavy vest that clearly said police on it. From what they could tell, they believed the suspect was a man. So from 3.50 until 4.20, the suspect's going from room to room in the church with a hammer or other tools in their hand. They're smashing windows, going through offices along the way, and spending several minutes in the kitchen. Officers weren't able to tell whether or not the suspect was armed in the video, but he did have something in his hand that he was using to pry open the doors with. Missy pulled into the church parking lot at 4.16 a.m. and parked where she could easily unload her car. At 4.20, she entered the church and walked through the main foyer and down the hallway towards the area where the suspect was, having no idea that anyone was even there. Missy eventually walked out of range of the camera's motion sensor and the camera turned off. The assault was not recorded, but the suspect was soon seen walking down one of the hallways and it's assumed that they were leaving the same way they came in. The first camper that morning arrived at the church at 4.35 a.m. and sat in their car while they waited for it to be time for the class at 5. At least two of the campers entered the church together and found Missy. And we still have so much more to get into after one quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. Here's this week's weather report. It's hot. It is really freaking hot, and it won't be getting better anytime soon. So to combat the sweat and the funk, Lumi Whole Body Deodorant is here to save the day. Lumi was created by an OBGYN who knows their way around body odor. Lumi is seriously safe to use anywhere on your body. We're talking pits, under boobs, thigh folds, belly buttons, butt cracks, and feet. On top of that, Lumi is clinically proven to block odor all day and control odor for up to 72 hours. Unlike those other deodorants that just try to cover up the smell with a fragrance, Lumi is formulated and powered by mandelic acid to stop odor before it even starts. It's like a pre-odorant. But wait, it gets even better. Lumi is aluminum-free, baking soda-free, and paraben-free. I keep Lumi deodorant wipes in my gym bag because that's a great time for a refresh. I'm partial to the lavender sage fragrance, but I can't wait to try their new powder fresh. Speaking of fresh, that's exactly how I feel after using Lumi. Or, to put it more eloquently, in the words of Outcast, I feel so fresh and so clean clean. So don't let body odor get you down. Get your hands on some Lumi whole body deodorant and say goodbye to funky smells for good. Trust us, your nose and anyone who comes near you will thank you. Lumi Starter Pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice like mini body wash and deodorant wipes, and free shipping. As a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi Starter Pack with code MOMS at LumiDeodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit LumiDeodorant.com and use code MOMS. Hey guys, as you know, I'm someone who loves knowing a little about everything. I love the news, I love entertainment, I love it all. But sometimes I don't have enough time to get all the information, all the little details and the minutia of everyday news because my goodness, it's constantly going. But thanks to the Newsworthy podcast, I can get all I need in little bite-sized pieces. So if the stress of the news is getting you down, but you still want to know what's going on in things like the election, check out the Newsworthy. And in these 10-minute episodes, they're just on the go listening. I can listen to it quickly on a walk, on my way bringing my kids to or from school or one of their activities. When I'm in line at the grocery store, there's never a wrong time to listen to the newsworthy. But if you feel bogged down by the news and kind of the negativity of it, but you still want to be informed on what's going on, the newsworthy is the place to do it. Erica at the newsworthy is an independent journalist and her team does really all the hard work and research for you. I love that the episodes are so well rounded and there will be fun stuff like tech or big stories. But the way Erica gives this, you know, efficient and neutral overview of the news and in just 10 minutes each weekday, it's 
it's it's perfect. Just search the Newsworthy in your podcast app or go to thenewsworthy.com to start listening. Again, search for the podcast The Newsworthy, two words, The Newsworthy, to make staying informed easier and more enjoyable every weekday. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own, and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me, and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable, and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now, baby butts rejoice. New Huggies Skin Essentials are here, a brand new dermatologist approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great gentle clean. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered too, with a training pant that's ultra soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we were getting into the story of the murder of Missy Beavers. She was murdered inside of a church in Midlothian, Texas. And now they're reviewing surveillance footage from inside the church that shows that there was a person that broke in wearing tactical gear and a vest that said police on it shortly before Missy arrived at the church and was then killed. A warrant to go through Missy's phone and iPad was obtained, and detectives asked the church staff to go through and see if there was anything missing from the church. There wasn't, so they also looked into whether or not the church had actually been burglarized in the previous year, and they found out that it hadn't. At 3 p.m., Brandon Beavers arrived in his rental car, and 30 minutes later, police held their first press conference. A seven-second clip of the suspect walking around the church wearing tactical gear was released, and authorities asked for anyone with information to come forward. Police told the public that the suspect was already inside the church when Missy arrived, and it was possible that she had interrupted a burglary in progress. But they also pointed out that 4 a.m. was a strange time to rob a church, so they weren't ruling out the possibility that Missy could have been targeted, but it was also possible that it was just an elaborate random situation. They did believe that the murder was an isolated incident, but they promised they would look into other similar offenses to see if there was any connection. They also said they believed the suspect was a man, but that would soon change as we get into the story a little bit more. Meanwhile, within 15 minutes of arriving home, Brandon was approached by Fox 4 on his doorstep looking for an interview. Brandon said that he hadn't really had the time to absorb everything just yet, and that he had just been given bits and pieces, but didn't really even know any specifics about what was going on. He told them that he was in Mississippi about to go on this fishing trip when he received the call from one of Missy's clients. And when he was asked to describe his wife, Brandon said that Missy was very passionate about transforming people's lives, both physically and mentally, and that she was a good wife and a good mother to their children. He said that she had an impactful relationship with many people, and he asked those who cared about her to pray for her and for whoever killed her to be caught. By the end of the first day, a local business had actually offered a $10,000 reward. The autopsy performed on Missy concluded that she had multiple puncture wounds found on her head and chest that were consistent with the tools that the suspect was carrying around in the building. Her cause of death was ultimately a head wound, but they didn't release that information to the public right away. Over the next week, officers slowly released more information and they announced that other agencies, including the Texas Rangers, ATF, and the FBI would all be joining in the investigation. On April 19th, another nine seconds of footage of the suspect inside the church was released. The person could be seen walking around, opening doors, and looking inside the rooms. On this day, they also retracted their previous statement that the suspect was a male and said that at this time, there just weren't enough facts to justify referring to the suspect as either male or female and said that either was really possible. They asked for the public to focus on the stature and mannerisms of the suspect, even the way the suspect walked, and to see if anything was recognizable. More recently, we saw this with the Delphi murders. The police talked about the suspect's gait and to look at that and to watch that on the small clip that they had because everyone has a little bit of a different way of walking and and something like that could even come up and jog someone's memory. 
So also on April 19th, Brandon spoke to Fox 4 and said he really hadn't had much time to get emotional about Missy's death. He said he had three daughters that he'd been attending to, and at this point, he's just exhausted. He hasn't been able to sleep. Brandon also said it was really that same morning that he'd even started to process what happened, and he really wasn't sure what to do from there, but he said he could only take things one day at a time. In this interview, he described Missy as a great woman, a great wife, a great mother, and a great friend who would be missed by many people. Brandon said he didn't recognize the suspect in the video, but he asked the public to watch the video themselves. Brandon didn't think anyone had targeted Missy, but he thought maybe she walked in on a burglary in progress. Brandon said he had talked to Missy the night before at around 9 p.m., and they said their I love yous, and then she went to bed. On April 22nd, Midlothian police held another press conference and released an additional two minutes of footage in the hopes of generating new leads. Once again, they asked the public to focus on the mannerisms and gait of the suspect. By this time, there was a lot of speculation on social media about who the killer could be. Many people thought that Brandon was involved simply because he's the husband. But the investigators confirmed that Brandon was in fact nine hours away in Biloxi at the time of the murder. So it was impossible that he was the actual killer. Nevertheless, people online continued to target him and someone even sent cruel messages to the Beaver's oldest daughter. Some people even pointed the finger at Brandon's father, whose name is Randy, So Randy was actually on a trip in California with his wife at the time of the murder, but this speculation still continued. And this is probably because um, authorities ended up releasing the details of a search warrant that revealed that Randy had actually taken a bloodstained shirt to a dry cleaner just four days after Missy's murder. So he dropped off the shirt and told the dry cleaner employee that the blood was from an animal. So the employee takes the shirt, but then calls the police, who comes and seizes the shirt and sends it off for testing. They did confirm that the blood actually came from a dog and not from a human. And upon further investigation into this, it was learned that a family member's dog had actually viciously attacked Randy's wife's dog. The dog was severely injured, so Randy rushed it to the emergency vet where the dog sadly died. So Randy said, you know, he understood why the dry cleaners called the police, and it was good that people were actually reporting suspicious activity, but he definitely did not have anything to do with his daughter-in-law's murder. Oh my gosh, good for (sighs) him that they did. Can you imagine if they were like, later they find out he dropped off a bloody shirt and they hadn't called it in? Oh my gosh, people would be all over that. So he was honestly lucky that they did that. Yes, definitely. On May 4th, Brandon met with the police on his own accord. Um, He actually told NBC5 that he frequently went to speak with the police when he had things that would come up or just things that were on his mind regarding the case. He said that he hadn't even read any of the reports about how Missy was killed because he just couldn't handle it. And he said that the only way he was surviving was because of his faith in God. The next day, investigators released details of search warrants for Missy's LinkedIn, as well as multiple AT&T phone numbers. And for the first time, it was revealed that Brandon and Missy were actually facing some relationship difficulties. Missy had been involved in multiple affairs, and Brandon informed the police that he knew about her involvement in at least one affair. It was also found out that less than three days before her murder, Missy showed a friend some bizarre messages that she had received on LinkedIn. The contents of the messages hasn't been released, but what we know is that they were described as being creepy and strange. Also in Missy's LinkedIn account was evidence of a romantic relationship with a man that Brandon had not mentioned, and that could be just because he didn't know about it. Only bits and pieces about this relationship have been made public, but it seems like Missy started talking to this man in January of 2016 through LinkedIn, and they continued to message each other until the time of her death. Messages were actually routinely deleted, so only some of them were able to be recovered, but they seem to indicate that Missy had an intimate relationship with the man and had arranged to meet each other at least once. Investigators did find and speak to the man and confirm that their relationship did exist, but there's no public information regarding whether or not they found anything noteworthy on his phone during the investigation. Information was recovered from AT&T, including calls, messages, text, emails, GPS, and other data from the phone of seven individuals, including Missy, Brandon, Randy, and one of the men Missy was having an affair with. 
They suspected that whoever killed Missy may have communicated with her and used a cell phone to monitor her workout schedule and potentially to record her murder. But there's no additional information about what they found through that warrant. On May 6th, local Texas authorities brought in the New York Police Department so they could use their high-tech tracking devices, which analyze pings from cell towers. They wanted to determine if the killer continued to go back to the crime scene. And if they did, the investigators could run surveillance and use a tracking device called Stingray. Mandy, I had never heard of Stingray before. Had you? I had never. And honestly, it's kind of freaky. It is. Okay, so with this Stingray technology, a phone will automatically connect to the Stingray without any control from the user, and it's able to mine data off the phone really quickly. So basically, if the person's come back to the church, they have the Stingray, they're able to basically hop on the person's computer via Stingray and take any information they want off of it. And that's legal. (laughs) That's the part that I'm just like, wow, okay. (laughs) That's the part that was a little surprising to me. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's definitely, you can see how it would be really useful in matters of law enforcement and um, investigations, but you can also see how it could be a slippery slope in the wrong hands. (laughs) Yeah. And you can see how a defense attorney would real quick be bringing that up in court as well. Yes. The Tarrant County DA's forensic and technology team was also brought in to focus on the surveillance footage and to try to build a more specific description of the suspect. On May 13th, the reward in Missy's case was increased to $20,000. A week later, officers held a press conference and said that the tips were still rolling in and they'd received over 1,000 tips, but many of these tips were based on speculation and not facts. And of course, these things being on speculation, which is really a waste of the police's time while they're looking into things that aren't really leading anywhere. They also said that their initial investigation focused on those closest to Missy, and that at this point, none of her family, friends, or coworkers were suspected in her murder. One officer said, quote, I just want to be clear that the Beavers family including Mr. Beavers and his father, Randy, have been cooperative, forthcoming, and provided detailed alibis that have all been corroborated through different sources. Until Missy's killer is caught, I will stop short of saying that any person is absolutely excluded, but to be clear, none of Missy's family are at the focus of this investigation, end quote. As we mentioned a little earlier, the Tarrant County DA's forensic and technology team completed a detailed forensic analysis of the surveillance footage and tried to come up with a more specific physical description of the suspect. The results of their analysis were that the suspect ranged anywhere from 5'2 to 5'7, which honestly is kind of a big range. They believed that the suspect was most likely light-skinned, although they couldn't be absolutely sure. And they said that the suspect went through great effort to conceal their identity, so the gender of the suspect remained unknown. They noted that the suspect's feet looked like they turned outward away from the body, and this is seen more predominantly with the right foot. So they were interested in persons who were within that height range and may have had a similar walk or gait during the time of the offense. So that part was kind of important, too, because they pointed out that it's possible that the person could have been walking that way because maybe they were injured at the time or there was something else causing them to temporarily walk in a way that they wouldn't normally be walking. The possibility that there was more than one person involved wasn't ruled out, but there was only one suspect ever seen on camera, so they were kind of thinking that it was just one person. As far as where the suspect could have gotten this tactical gear and a police vest, authorities said that that stuff is actually just readily available and it's not controlled, so anyone can buy it. And that's another thing I think that kind of surprised me in this story. I understand being able to buy like tactical gear like and stuff like that, but vests that say police on them, like that yeah. surprises me that that is not controlled, you know, and not regulated in any way. Yeah, no, I was, the fact that even police are like, yeah, no, they're they're all out there. They're everywhere. Yeah. You can get, anyone can get them. Yeah, it is shocking. Yeah. A still shot of a silver Nissan Altima that was spotted about half a mile away from the church a few hours before Missy was killed was also released to the public. The investigator said that they didn't think the driver of that vehicle was involved in the murder in any way, but they still did want to speak to them. Brandon continued to cooperate with the police, and he did what he could to aid in the investigation. He said that he insisted on meeting with officers every week and that nobody, even himself, should be considered excluded. 
Brandon said that he had personally exhausted every scenario and avenue possible with trying to figure out who had done this. And he thought it could be anything from business related to some kind of jealousy. Brandon said that he felt really discouraged and he pleaded for the killer to turn themselves in. Brandon talked about how he had been just doing his best to shield his daughters from the things the media was reporting on, particularly the things they were saying about the affairs that Missy was having and the issues that the Beavers were having within their marriage. At some point, Brandon told People Magazine that he believed Missy's killer was someone that knew her and had a motive. He asked why somebody would break into a church dressed in tactical gear, then go through the building breaking windows, and then murder a woman and just leave. The suspect didn't even take Missy's wedding ring or any of the valuables that she had in her truck. Or anything in the church. So why would they have even broken in in the first place? Right. Then on May 25th, it was reported that Facebook friend requests had actually been sent to several of Missy's friends starting about a month after her death. And the profile was from someone that was using Missy's name. Days later, police told NBC News, quote, the best we can tell so far, the profile is gone, which means a dead end for us. They said it could have been a scam, a glitch, or even a joke, which is like so disturbing to think of someone creating a Facebook page using the name of somebody who has been recently murdered and sending friend requests to their friends and family. That kind of also makes me think that it was definitely somebody who knew her that that murdered her. I don't know. That kind of is strange to me that someone would do that. Well, I don't know because this was a huge story. So I feel like you just get the wrong kind of person who's like a troll on the internet and they would do something like this. That's true. And we have a lot more to get into after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. I spent last week decluttering my house. Seriously, we had so much stuff and it just takes up so much room. And one thing I assumed would just always take up a big amount of space forever was my laundry detergent. But that's before I tried Earth Breeze. Not only does Earth Breeze come in a tiny package, it's actually biodegradable and plastic free. It's like carrying around a cloud. And if you're like, cool, Melissa, but use words like an actual adult, well, think dryer sheets, but smaller. Earth Breeze sheets are liquidless and dissolve 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. There's no measuring, no more mess, and no more giant plastic jugs to lug around. Just toss the sheet in and you're in business. Earth Breeze has really revolutionized the whole detergent game. Not only is Earth Breeze compatible with HE washers, gray water systems, as well as being septic safe, but their eco sheets are hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested, so even sensitive skin can join in on the fun. And one big plus for those of us who hate running out of detergent but still keep doing it is their flexible subscriptions, which are a game changer. You can adjust, pause, or cancel at any time without any annoying contracts or fees. And to top it all off, they offer free carbon neutral shipping right to your doorstep at a frequency that works for your unique lifestyle. I love the convenience of Earth Breeze and the fact that they are biodegradable and plastic free, but also it's really easy to get your kid to wash their own clothes. They can just throw in a sheet and they're done. Have you ever seen a kid try to pour detergent into a tiny cup? Your nerves will be shot for days. And most importantly, Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and will leave your clothes cleaner than a whistle. And if you're not satisfied, they offer a risk-free 100% satisfaction guarantee, no questions asked, no return necessary. Switch from the old-fashioned goo to something new. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash moms to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash moms for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash moms. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we were speaking about the police investigation into Missy's murder, some of the things that had gone on after the murder and kind of where the police were at this point. And so things started slowing down in the investigation around June. There weren't as many tips rolling in and the media coverage was falling off. The Beavers family was very frustrated at this point because they had no answers. And even though police had officially said that the family was cleared of suspicion, people were still blaming Brandon and other family members for Missy's death. In July, new investigators from Dallas and Fort Worth took a look at the case, but they didn't find anything new, and the investigation slowed down even more. At some point, the Midlothian Police Department hired a forensic podiatrist to review the footage of the suspect and weigh in on his or her gait. 
So the doctor actually had a police officer put on similar tactical gear and walk around with it on and then without it on. The doctor also put the gear on himself to see how it felt and how it affected his walking. It was determined that the gear plus carrying a weapon does affect gait. So it's difficult to say whether or not the killer moved that way in their regular clothing. And so he also said that you cannot tell gender by gait. In October, the reward was increased yet again to $50,000. In December, investigators searched a home in the 1400 block of Nichols Street, about 30 miles away from Midlothian. The home was owned by a retired officer with a similar gait to the one seen in the video footage. This search ultimately turned up nothing in regards to Missy's death. The owner of the home was cleared as a suspect after they confirmed his alibi. In January of 2017, footage of the Nissan Altima police were trying to locate was released. They had only released a still shot before, but in this new footage, the car can be seen circling the parking lot of SWFA Outdoors, which was a few miles away from the church. So at one point, the driver of this Nissan Altima turns off their lights and then turns them back on. And the police reiterated that they didn't think the driver was actually involved in the murder, but they still wanted to speak to them. As of today, though, we don't think police have ever located the driver of this car. And I understand that they like release information a little at a time. They have to keep some close to the chest, but it feels like the car could have been a very important thing to get out there early. Right. Yeah. And I don't know if you had a chance to look at some of that footage, um, Melissa, but I watched yeah. like the, v- the video of the car in that parking lot and it's all just so weird, you know, like it just, it really yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense. It's like, what was that car doing there? You know, like it doesn't really, it just doesn't make a lot of sense at that time of day. Um, and yeah. so you can understand why the police also would like to speak to them and just find out like, mm-hmm. even if it's just like, did you see anything or what other vehicles were in the area? You know, just things right. like that. It's like not necessarily thinking that they had anything to do with it, but just they could have seen something or heard something, you know, they were in the area around the time that Missy was murdered. Right. For the one-year anniversary of Missy's murder, the Midlothian PD assistant chief told NBC DFW that justice had been delayed for too long in this case and that they were still waiting for that one critical vital tip that they needed. The assistant chief said, quote, it's just difficult from a human perspective to believe that a wife, a girlfriend, brother, sister, husband, nobody was spoken to, nobody had a serious question about where that person was that day. And so, yes, absolutely, that would be great if that person came forward. In December, a little over a year and a half after the murder, Brandon told ABC that he was done spending his days hunting for Missy's killer. He talked about how he had really felt this immense responsibility to Missy to find the person who killed her, but he said he had come to feel that that just was not realistic, and he felt powerless to solve the case, and his biggest priority was his daughters and their welfare. So he was saying, you know, for everybody's well-being, you know, mentally, emotionally, and for their healing, he felt that it was best to kind of take a step back and not be as hands-on, I guess, as he was with, um, you know, looking for Missy's killer. In February of 2018, a new detective was assigned to Missy's case, and they began reviewing all the tips starting from the beginning. The MPD assistant chief told NBC DFW, quote, if you told me two years ago that we would be talking about this case and it's still unresolved, I would have thought you were crazy. It's just not something I anticipated. Missy was a mother, daughter, wife, and had three little girls. To look across the table at her family and have to admit the amount of information that we don't know is frustrating, end quote. So at the two-year mark, police said they were still working with outside resources and pursuing new leads as new investigative techniques are released. In April of 2019, the three-year anniversary of Missy's murder passed, and detectives said they were still meeting once a week to discuss her case and review new leads. Unfortunately, though, those new leads weren't panning out. At the five-year mark in April of 2021, Midlothian police said that Missy's murder was not a cold case and that tips were still coming in almost daily. They had over 3,000 tips in total and had traveled across Texas and into some other states to follow leads. The department also added a retired federal agent whose primary responsibility was to look over Missy's case. 
The case has been presented to several homicide investigators' associates for review, but unfortunately, no new investigative work was generated from it. The MPD revealed a new height analysis of the suspect that worked by estimating the vertical distance from the floor to the top of the head where the suspect had on to be about five foot eight. So actually that original range that they had, this is even higher than that. So it's almost like they just, they just don't know. The reward was also increased to $150,000 in April of 2021. The True Crime Broads podcast, which was created to keep Missy's case in the public eye, raised money for the reward and for a billboard to advertise the reward. Brandon told KRLD that he'd been holding on to hope and trying to stay busy. He said, quote, you have the family, Missy's family, and there is still a significant amount of sadness that still prevails in our hearts and minds, end quote. So where is this case at today? Um, So just kind of to recap, It was at some point before 3.50 a.m. on April 18th, 2016, that the suspect entered Creekside Church of Christ and started rummaging around with a hammer or a similar tool. Missy entered the church at around 4.20 a.m. She was murdered at some point before 5 a.m. when her body was discovered. She had multiple puncture wounds on her head and chest that were consistent with the tools the suspect was carrying throughout the building. Today, MPD still asks that people watch the surveillance footage of the suspect who is estimated to be five foot eight with a helmet on. Investigators do not know the gender or race of the suspect. However, they believe the suspect is light skinned. Investigators are also looking for the driver of that silver Nissan Altima who was seen in the parking lot of SWFA Outdoors, which is just a few miles from the church a few hours before Missy was murdered. The driver is not a suspect, but the police would like to speak with them. The police have not released a motive in Missy's attack, and they haven't officially said if they believe she was targeted or not. They have never named a person of interest, and they have publicly cleared all of Missy's family, friends, and co-workers. None of them are suspects in her murder. If you have any information, you can call Crime Stoppers of Ellis County at 972-937-7297. Or call the Midlothian Police Department Criminal Investigation Division at 972-775-7634. If the information provided leads to an arresting conviction, the person may be eligible for a $150,000 reward. This case is one of the craziest to me because I just find it so incredible that they have so much footage of the suspect walking around in this church, and yet they have still not been able to find that one missing link, like they said, that one critical piece that they're missing to be able to figure out who did this. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you because you would think, oh, slam dunk, somebody's going to recognize this person. Something's going to come up, but this person didn't take anything. They didn't. It seems like they were there for one job and one job only to make it look like there was a robbery. That's what I think at least. And to attack Missy. It doesn't make any sense it robbery doesn't make any sense sense. no and from the footage and we can link that too in the show notes um but the footage from inside of the church where you see the suspect walking around they're not it's very clear they're not there to rob the building they're not walking around looking for anything in particular they're actually moving quite slowly it is exactly it very much feels like they knew around when Missy would be there. They got there early and they were just walking around killing time. I mean, they were kind of breaking windows and stuff, but who knows what, you know, why they were doing that. Maybe just to make it look like it was a robbery, but they weren't actually taking anything. They weren't really um, doing a whole lot. It just definitely seems like they were there specifically to kill Missy. But like the police said, they don't know, you know, if it was a targeted attack or if she did just walk in on a burglary in progress. To me, after seeing the footage, I personally lean more towards Um, this was somebody who knew her. And I really hope that they finally will get that tip that they need to figure out who's responsible. It's another one of those stories that is very solvable. They know it's solvable. There's, there's video evidence of somebody being there. There's, it hasn't, it didn't happen that long ago. They have a Nissan Ultima, you know, they have somebody they want to talk to. They have enough of these little pieces that just need to be put together. And really just one person needs to say something, the right person to say something. That's all they need. So I really hope for her family and for her girls and husband and family that they're able to find who did this to her. Yeah. 
I just want to say a quick thank you also to Haley's assistant, Anna, who works with her on um, researching the stories. She did a lot of the work on this one and did an amazing job. So yeah, thank you so much, Anna, for your help with this story. They are the best. Dream team. Absolutely dream team. All right, Melissa, before we get out of here for the day, let's do, let's turn the page. Let's turn the page. I almost forgot what I was supposed to say there. <laughs> Ooh, that's not good because I'm not going to be able to help you. Um, yeah, let's do last thing before we go. And Mandy, I don't know if you've, we talked about Netflix shows, right? We did Love is Blind. We tried to do the reunion. That was a disaster for oh, Netflix. Oh my goodness. Yes. Any of you who have been watching Love is Blind probably know what happened. We were all ready and set to go and watch it and have a little live watch party and chat with some of our listeners who were watching along with us. And yeah, then the show did not go on. <laughs> so It went on the very, next day and it was terrible. Yeah. So it, it was, was terrible. Yeah, I barely, worse. I actually barely even watched. Um, I mean, I, wa- I had it on, but I wasn't really like sucked into it or paying attention. I didn't think it was that no. great. So there's some good but Vanessa I have Lachey. Been, yes, I have been, been loving terrible. the memes and the drama after so I've sent you a million great. TikToks. And yeah. every time I'm like, Melissa, you got to think about it. You can't send her all the TikToks on this. You got to be really specific. <laughs> she I has listened to, think to you're an doing entire something podcast else with your today. Life. Oh. <laughs> I listened to a whole on podcast it? today that, that Micah was um, on. She was a guest on <gasps> and it was pretty good. I'll have to send it to you. <laughs> yeah. You also tell me what it was. Um, yeah. Ooh, I like it. That's like my, that's, I listen to way too many of those. So anyway, back to Netflix. Netflix also has a show out this week called The Florida Man, and it inspired some thought in us. My son is doing a Florida Man podcast. I mean, like a for fun thing his school is doing. I put a clip up on um, Instagram that was pretty funny of him, like a little clip of him. Hilarious. uh, Doing it. Wasn't (laughs) that great? He's so funny. Um, And so anyway, uh, we thought we would do some Florida Man stories. We haven't done those in a while. Thought it might be sort of fun to do in honor of Florida Man's story and my own little personal Florida Man. Mandy, do you want to kick it off with the first Florida Man story? All right. Yes, I have my first story here for you. Something that I feel could only happen right here in our great state. Um, Florida Man was arrested after phoning the police to have some meth tested for authenticity after he purchased it from a local bar. So basically, I read the story. The guy bought drugs at a bar, went home and did the drugs and felt that um, he actually told the police that he was a drug connoisseur. And so he knew what it was supposed to feel like when you take meth. And this stuff was not the real deal. So he wanted them to test it for authenticity and let him know if it was – really meth or not. So yeah, he obviously got arrested. <laughs> well, I don't think you're a very good connoisseur if you have to ask the police to test this right. drug. Like, yeah. <laughs> do you know your stuff or do you not, Walter White? Right. Um, okay, Mandy, I've got one. Uh, this one could have come up before, but I just truly love it. Okay. A Florida man is arrested after trying to steal merchandise from a store. And by merchandise, I, of course, mean a rack of ribs, some mashed potatoes, <laughs> and two packs of hamburger buns. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I feel, like, terrible if people are in a position where they actually have to sure. feel like they have to steal food, for sure. So I feel like that's not a that's not a, a hill that I'm willing to die on, you know? But, no, like, also, no. it's very Florida. A rack of to ribs, ribs is different. I know. <laughs> That's why it's crazy. I'm fine with the the hamburger buns. I'm fine with. It's right. the rack of ribs. And also, like, who are you to be able to fit an entire rack of ribs? If I'm wearing pants, they are just on, right. barely holding on. That's the so seams true. are doing Where did their you work. Put them? How are you doing this? <laughs> that's That's really my issue with the whole story oh yeah that's true i didn't even think about like where would you put them (laughs) yeah i got no room in these pants (laughs) okay so this one's kind of sad and also kind of crazy just because i'm shocked that it was able to even happen um so this headline is a florida man drinks bleach in courtroom after being found guilty (gasps) of armed robbery so he was obviously found guilty of armed robbery and apparently had this cup and he was like sitting at his table like with his counsel and everything his lawyers were there and he just started like drinking out of this cup and immediately got sick and like fell to the ground like he just like was chugging out of this cup and his family was in the courtroom and everything and they were like freaking out and of course they're like how did this even happen like how did he even get this bleach or whatever it was into this cup into the courtroom like when nobody even noticed or anything but oh. yeah. Did he survive? He did survive. Okay. He did. Yes. Okay. Well, then 
That's a that's the only story. reason why I mentioned it. Yeah, he yeah, survived. I've heard of that happening in like there was I've seen the video or part of it. The guy that took like cyanide or something terrible, like same kind yeah. of idea. He just took it, but it did not end with him just being sick. It was much worse. So let's continue for something more ridiculous. Mandy, Murdoch, Florida, which I've actually never heard of. The title of this is a man walks into a strip club with a cat. So a guy wants to go to a strip club and he gets mad, calls 911 because he's like, hey, listen, I want to go in. I'm a paying customer. I should be allowed to bring my cat. And they're like, actually, you can't do those things. So he he was not allowed, but he did call 911 and tell him his business. And he was just not, this is a Puss in Boots establishment. It was not. Wow. It was not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Funny. All right. So my last one is really kind of like two things wrapped in one because, of course, here in Florida, we're surrounded by water. We've got swamps. We've got lakes. We've got oceans. We've got it all. So I got a couple headlines that are kind of similar. Apparently, criminals like to use the water, bodies of water that we have to hide sure. from police. So one of them is helicopter chases Florida man fleeing crime scene by running into the sea. He got about 200 feet into the ocean before they got to him and (laughs) nabbed him. I don't know where he was going or what his plan was. And then another one says a Florida driver strips down, hides in swamp to evade police after crash. He was driving without insurance or a valid license and he just went into a swamp, which that was dangerous because honestly, give me a ticket. I'm not getting in the swamp infested or gator infested swamp waters of Florida. That Okay, just, so there's I will get my license suspended before I would do that. <laughs> yeah, there's an area between where I live and where you live and there is an area where one day I was bringing my kids somewhere and it was all take like police were everywhere there's helicopters and it was all a swampy area and they were looking for somebody that had went into that area i'm not saying that's the same story because it's not because these people do this kind of thing all the time but like i was like no just arrest me i don't even care just get me out of here i don't want to do this it's going in a swamp People purposely do it. I read another story I didn't include, but basically the gist of it was that this person was biking on like a nature trail that was like in a swampy area, f- accidentally fell off their bike, but happened to like fall right where there was like an alligator with a nest and the alligator bit this person. Somebody else came by and was able to help them get out of the water, I guess, but literally was riding a bike and fell and then got attacked by an alligator like when they fell on the ground. So I'm like, wow, oh. that is... <laughs> Oh, to whoever the person was, bikes. <laughs> right? The person who asked us last time, like, if Florida has a lot of alligators, we might have lied. I think we, they're, <laughs> this part should tell There's you. There's quite a few. There's yeah. plenty. Okay, so my last story, I love the story. There is a guy, this was in Orlando. He was blocking the path of a truck at this Wawa in Orlando by doing a flip in the middle of the road. And the officers come to like get him out of the middle of the road because he's in the middle of the road. But he's like, able- like he's doing gymnastics? Yes. It literally calls him a gymnastics enthusiast. So he does that. When police go to get him, he's actually able to get away. Do you want to know how he was able to get away? Please tell me he like cartwheeled off or something. He did a cartwheel. That's exactly (laughs) what he did. (laughs) They were, of course, able to arrest him after that. I saw a clip. It's absolutely hilarious. He just... And like, he's 40. My wrist doing a cartwheel, like, I don't have that kind of confidence. They're just going to snap just, in half if I go down on that. But yeah, he's 40. He's I love eventually to see people out having charged. fun with life. <laughs> Is that having fun with life? That's like literally <laughs> the craziest thing I've ever heard. But I just love the idea. We'll have to post that clip too, because it is just <laughs> wild to see somebody running from the police and going into a, a handspring. So yeah, <laughs> that's too funny. All right. Well, those are fun Florida man stories. Um, hopefully your son, hopefully we didn't steal any of his his podcast ideas. No, with our stories. <laughs> yeah. He, luckily, he's already given it up. He was like, I, I was like, oh, he do it again, bud. He's it. like, nah. I'm like, see, it's harder than you think. Yeah. 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 yeah it's work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, that is a story for this week. Um, Before we get out of here, we just did have one quick little announcement, though, for Patreon subscribers or those of you who maybe are still thinking about joining us on Patreon. We've been really trying to come up with some more fun things that we can do that you guys might enjoy. So, Melissa, what are we on now? What are we doing now? Oh, okay. Love is Blind is over. Love is Blind is over. 
It's <laughs> over. So we're thinking right now, we're going to try and do like monthly meetups, chats, something like that. We'll figure out, out with us. how, yeah, hang out with us. And so we're going to do like a vote in Patreon so we can try and get the most people there in a day and time that works for people. And so if you're on Patreon, look for that. We'll have the voting out pretty soon this week. I'll wait until this is released. We'll do that and we'll try and do that once a month. We might be able to do something else or something more, but for now, that's where we're, this is where we've landed. If you've got another idea on Patreon, let us know. Oh, you can join Patreon if you want to. Patreon.com slash Moms and Mysteries podcast. Find us there. Join us. Bonus episodes every month. Every week, we release episode early, ad-free. And so if you want to do that, now is a great time to join. And all the Patreon content from the last five years is there. So you yeah, last five years there's so some much weird stuff, stuff over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's <laughs> there is some weird stuff. If you start when people comment back far on enough. stuff yeah. for like two years ago, I'm like, oh, let's not do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't go back any further than one year. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, that is it for this week. We will be back next week, same time, same place, new story. Have a great week. Bye.